have a couple of announcements before we start. Bill Spears is resting at home after uh, staying in the hospital. He's doing a little bit better, but he still needs our prayers. Uh, remember Chris Enoch? He's on the kidney transplant, transplant list. Keep them in your prayers. Kathy Simmons' brother, Ray Peters, is having heart problems. Uh, brother Paul Lemon is now ready to go and have the fluid drained from his brain. Remember him in your prayers. And <clears throat> Mike Carpenter's great nephew had heart surgery. He might have to have a chest tube. Danny Carpenter's neighbor, Kenneth Beerhart, passed away a few days ago. Please keep the family in your prayers. Deb Apole, Apole, a friend of Yvonne's, has been diagnosed with stage 3 kidney disease. Antonio Dimitroy has diabetes and Crohn's disease and has a mass on his kidney. Roberta Piggott is suffering from abdominal pain, weakness, and dizziness. Please keep Roberta in your prayers. Any other announcements concerning the sick? We're going to have game night on June 19th at 7 p.m. And if you feel safe and want to come, please join us. Bring a snack if you can. Uh, ladies Bible class, Tuesday at 8 p.m. online at thecollyhouse.org. And Jordan and Jared Flynn will be getting married on the 27th, 3 30 at the church bell. Any other announcements concerning any activities or anything like that? The order of worship tonight <clears throat> Tyler Bond will be leading the singing, Josiah Clark will have the reading. Danny Carpenter Sr. will lead us in prayer, and Brother Mike Carpenter will be in charge of communion. Elvis is bringing the message tonight, The Woman and the Drink. I'll turn it over, Brother. Just a quick fair warning. Uh, summer has not been treating me well, so I ain't going to be doing much better than Mark did this morning. <laughs> you, know, you, will, you will do better than I did this morning. Page 13, a blessing in prayer. All four verses. There is rest, sweet rest at the Master's feet. There is favor now at the mercy seat. For atoning blood has been sprinkled there. There is always a blessing, a blessing.
a blessing in prayer. The waiting this evening will be taken from Revelation chapter 11, verse 19. And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament, and there was lightnings and the vo and voices and thunderings and earthquake and great hail. you have bestowed upon us this day and days past, dear Lord, and we thank you so much for your son, Jesus, the greatest blessing we could anyone ever have, dear Lord, and we thank you so much it was a great sacrifice that you both made when he went to that cross and died for our sins, dear Father, but we thank you very much for everything you do for us. We ask you, dear Lord, to be with all of us this evening as he brings us a word. And thank you, dear Father, for everything that you do for us. We ask you, dear Lord, to be with those on our sick list. Be with them, and if anything at all, dear Lord, you know what they need more than anything. Lay a hand up on them and see if they can get back better health, Father. Maybe they'll return to services with us. We ask you, dear Lord, to forgive us now if we have failed you in any way. And dear Lord, we thank you for everything. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Happy. 
Is thy heart right with God? I'm not sure if I have the confidence to start this one, but here I go. Have thine affections been nailed to the cross? Is thy heart You know what? Let's just start something else. I'm, I can't do this, apparently. <clears throat> have thine affections been nailed to the cross? Is thy heart will be 671. <clears throat> good, evening. good evening. It's good to see each one tonight. Certainly glad you're with us for our Sunday evening Bible study to get our Sunday. What is this? Worship. I don't get confused, I guess. Someone asked to look at my brain earlier and I said, you don't want to look up there. The spider webs and a couple uh, mice running around and maybe a treadmill or something going on up there. But it's good to see everyone tonight. We have been, I want to mention this, we have been having some faithful people watch from other parts of the world, watch almost every service on Facebook, so we uh, welcome them as well. And it's good to be able to still get out um, into the world uh, virtually. If you have your Bibles, you can open to Revelation. We will begin with Revelation chapter 12. Now, thinking about some of the texts that we have gone through thus far in the book of Revelation, and we've come to the end of chapter 11, and Josiah read the last verse of chapter 11 just a few moments ago, as it seems like a storm is beginning to set when we talk about that there will be thunder and hail and all these things, it makes us think that, that, that a storm is brewing our way and coming our way. And as we finished up the seventh trumpet last week, as the seventh trumpet sounded, the time of judgment had come. What we think back to the, what we might think that immediately after this that we're going to see the seven bowls. But we won't see the seven bowls for many chapters until we get to about chapter 15 and 16. Because what we'll see in chapter 12, chapter 13 and 14 is an introduction to our enemy. Chapter 12 will point him out as the devil. Chapter 13, we will see a couple of different names for him.
We'll see him uh, later removed as the, the devil. In chapter 13, we'll see his two accompanying, the beast and the false prophet. In chapter 14, we'll talk about Babylon the Great. So, but what we'll see is we'll see several names for the devil introduced and several characters of the devil introduced and then taken back. They'll, they'll enter the stage, so to speak, that, that we present here, the stage, and then they'll go back in reverse order one by one. And we'll find out that, that behind the whole scene, in control of all these evil people, if you will, evil entities, is one person the devil. And so we'll see that in these three chapters as we look at this. Now chapter 12 is pivotal because scholars generally agree it, that it starts the second main division of the book of Revelation. The first half of the book, chapters 1 through 11, have been primarily concerned with the conflict between the church and the state Rome. And what all the things that Rome has done to the church in that time period, in the first century time period. Someone was asking me this morning, well, uh, it's somewhat hard to understand the book of Revelation because some of it seems like it happened in the past, some of it seems like it will happen in the future, and things like that. Well, I will state for you that the first 11 chapters is between Rome and the church, the seven churches of Asia. Now, what we're going to do in these chapters are introduce some things, and we'll see the seven bowls, and then after that, about chapter 19, we'll look at future events that will be yet to come as we go through that. Uh, so we'll see this, what we're going to see now in chapter 12, 13, and 14, and some of the second part is behind the scenes. And, and the only way to present um, the book of Revelation is as a stage, and on the stage you have characters that... that John and Jesus will, will bring onto the stage, and then he'll bring those characters off of the stage, if you will. So that's why it's so colorful and, and imagery, and it's to make them think. So the primary purpose of this chapter, of chapter 12, is to introduce the arch enemy of God. Who is the arch enemy of God? Well, Satan, the devil. And so we'll introduce him, really, and, and the section 12 through 14 reveals that the devil has been responsible for the Christian's troubles and problems. And it explains why Satan despises Christians. Have you ever thought about that? When you became a Christian, I know most people are, are probably Christians here, and when you became a Christian, whether it was just a, a few years ago or years and years and years ago, when you went down into that water and you came up, not only were you given the gift of the Holy Spirit, but, but someone, Satan, looked down on you and began to despise you. And you, you think that Satan has caused you some difficulties in that time since then? Well, certainly he has. And it also answers that early Christians most some questions Two questions that they must have been asking. And the first question is, why are we being treated like this? Why would anybody treat Christians the way the Roman government treated Christians? Why were they persecuting? Why were they hurting them? Why were they not allowing them to meet and, and, and burning them at the stake and other things? And question number two, why does Rome, the government at that time, hate us so much? And I put the government in there because... Rome wasn't the last government, or the first. Well, it was the first to hate Christians, but not the first to hurt, hate people of God. And it certainly hasn't been the last. We have brothers and sisters in Christ that, that are in many other countries around the world that cannot openly meet like this. They have to meet behind closed doors. And I know that some of our other brothers and sisters in countries um, have a little thing. I've mentioned this before. It's every day it's somebody's birthday. And they'll get a cake. Every worship service has a cake. And, and whether it's Mark's birthday or, or Mike's birthday or, or whatever, or it, it may not be anybody's birthday, but they celebrate that birthday and they have that cake ready to go. Because if the government comes in there, what are you there for? You're there for the birthday party. You're not there to worship. That's just what they have to do to be able to gather together to worship. So why at this particular time was the state doing. Now let's look at verses 1 and 2 as we begin tonight. A great sign appeared. Where did it appear? In heaven. A 
course, this is after the last part. You could run to chapter 11 and, and, and right into chapter 12 there if you want to. I know there's a chapter break and there's some verse breaks at, after 1 and 2 and after 3 and 4 and after 5 and 6. But you could really run all this together if you want to. A great sign appeared in heaven. Where's the sign? It's in heaven. A woman clothed. Here's the sign. It's a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet. And on her head was a crown of 12 stars. And she was with a child. She's pregnant. And she cried out, being in labor and in pain to give birth. So we have the passage there. And by the way, We'll see in this chapter, and we haven't got to that yet, we won't get to it probably very much today, but we'll see more names for Satan in chapter 12 than anywhere else in the scriptures. You think he had, well, if you think, well, does God have a lot of names? God has Yahweh, Jehovah, and you can go through the list. He's got a few, but Satan has all kinds of names. So when we think of this, this sign appeared in heaven, in context, this word in heaven does not refer to where God and Jesus are. It refers to the cloud, what we would call the cloud area. We look up and we kind of see the clouds, and this is where the sign would appear. There's different words for different things there. And this great sign that John saw was a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and her head a crown of 12 stars. It's kind of an image there of the sign that we see. Um, now, as we look at these images, and these are some that you'll just see on the Internet. If you type that into Google, these are the pictures you'll get. Uh, because these, you know, we, we don't know what that would look like. And I might say there's probably a hundred different ways that Google whoever put these images in, would say that this would look like. And, and so we see a, you know, this is just an imagery that we see. So we see a woman, and the woman looks, looks beautiful, and the woman is with child, and we see the sun, moon, and stars represented in the woman. And, and then we see this 12 here, don't we? Well, 12 represents many things in the scripture. And we see some of the things, I don't think you can see that image very well, 12 lions, uh, 12 how many spies of Moses and then 12 uh, into uh, Canaan? Um, 12 apostles, 12 bulls, part of the, the temple uh, furnishing, and, and on and on and on. 12, Jacob has 12 sons. Ishmael has 12 sons. Um, and, and on and on, you see 12 apostles. You see 12 used as a number of completeness in the Bible. So if I ask you, if, son, if you see that on a test, what does number 12 represent in the Bible? You would say, Complete. Well, why is that? Well, 12 apostles. Why did God pick 12? That's God's number. 12, um, you know, all these things are different 12s. So we see a few things. And the first, the crown on the woman is wearing is uh, uh, the crown of victory. It's the crown of victory that's on her head. So that's important. So no matter what happens to this woman, and it might get pretty ugly, because this is going to be an ugly scene, we know that this woman is wearing a crown of victory. The number 12, of course, carries this idea of completeness. So she was dressed in a luminous garment woven from the rays of the sun. What a beautiful garment that would be. Each thread glowing, you can imagine that. And, and, and her... Her tiara, if you will, was composed of 12 celestial diamonds, pulsing with white and, with, and red fire, and her feet were planted upon the moon. She was dazzling, glorious, and magnificent. She was dazzling, glorious, and magnificent. And it will be suggested that in the last part of the chapter that the woman is the church. We'll look at that in just a moment. The woman is the church. Well, well isn't the woman just, the, the church just beautiful? And, and, and so we see this vision, if you will, of the church and, and surrounded in the church there. And the possible interpretation has promoted several writers that, that comment that the church was unattractive from the world standpoint but beautiful from God's standpoint. Does that make any sense? 
from, from sometimes from the world standpoint, especially in the first century world, that the church may have been unattractive. Why would the church be unattractive in the first century world? Well, if I join the church in the first century world, I'm taking my life at my hands. That could be kind of scary. Now, I would think in 2020, the church would be a little bit attractive. But if you... What does the church bring me that is attractive spiritually? That's a relationship with Jesus Christ, a relationship with God. And we see that the woman was vulnerable, as vulnerable as a woman can be, for she was with a child. She was pregnant. So that's going to make her vulnerable. And, and she cried out in labor to give birth. The woman uh, um, giving birth has no thought or, or strength for anything else but what? For the baby and giving birth. So she's not worried about this or that. And it's the church which is being persecuted, a church which God is protecting. But when we think about and look at the church, we see Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18. Jesus came into the region of Caesarea, or excuse me, uh, Peter came into the region of Caesarea Philippi. And they asked Peter, who, who do men say? I had it right the first time. Jesus came into the region. And asked Peter, who do men say that I am? And he said, well, some say one of the prophets, some say a lot, you know. And they go through a list and say, but Peter, who do you say I am? He says, I say you're Jesus, the son of the living God. Verse 18, and I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. This is Jesus talking. And the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever... Thou shalt bind on earth, shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And, and so we have this church. And when we think of the church that Jesus built upon this rock, I will build my church. The church is a firm foundation. And, and, and Satan should be afraid of the church. When we talk to our friends about Christ, Satan should be saying, oh, oh no, he, he's going to get to this person. I don't want him to get to that person. I, I don't want that person. The last thing Satan wants to do is for people to become Christians. The last thing that Satan wants people to do is for people to open their Bibles. The last thing Satan wants people to do is to, to sing songs of praise. The last thing Satan wants us to do is, is come together as a church and, and worship together and build each other up as a church. The last thing, the very last thing that Satan wants is for us to grow as a body of believers in word and in deed and in number. You see, Satan doesn't want anything to do with the church that he never did, and it's his arch enemy. How would we look at him? Jesus and John describe him as ugly. Plain, old, ugly. But you have the beautiful woman, and it's a woman described as the church. The woman is apparently one of those shifting symbols, not uncommon to the book of Revelation. First representing one thing, and, and, and then another, perhaps the simplest way to, to, to clear up the difficulties to remember that the relationship between fresh, fleshly Israel the Old Testament, and spiritual Israel, the New Testament. Leon Morris said this. He points out that for the early Christians, there was a more important continuity between the old Israel and the church, the true Israel. So if you're a first century Christian, you're really kind of looking to that old Israel kind of see that relationship that old Israel had with God. Edward Myers says that it identifies the woman as the people of God under both covenants. Under both covenants. The Old Covenant, which is the Old Testament, the New Covenant, first in its Jewish form, that would be the Old Covenant, and then in its Christian form, that would be the New Covenant. And so as recognizing this woman, basically, as the people of God, or, or some would say the church, more important than an exact identification is the contrast between her and the dragon. We haven't really got to the dragon yet before this lovely but vulnerable creature encountered a monster as ugly as the woman was beautiful. Let's look at verse 3 and 4. We'll see this 
monster, if you will. I know there's a small picture in there, but the monster, I want you to notice the size difference in the monster. Much bigger than the woman. How would we balance out how many members there are of the church and, and, and the rest of the population of the world that's not, wants nothing to do with the church? Well, the woman with the church would be small, wouldn't it? Look at the text with me. Then another sign appeared in heaven. Where, where the sign? Of, where was the sign? In heaven. Another sign appeared in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads, ten horns, and on his heads were seven diadems. And his tail swept away a third of the stars of heaven, threw them to the earth. The dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she gave birth, he might devour the what? Child. Now that should make you start to think a little bit, especially in verse 4. You just read that verse and you read nothing else. Woman giving birth and they want to devour the child. Where does that take your mind? Well, it probably should take your mind, first of all, to the Old Testament. Who did they want to devour? Who did they look for? Moses. Well, when we come to the New Testament... What is the child that they're looking for? Well, that child is Jesus. Now, this creature is not the dragon that we get from fairy tale books, if you will. For a matter of fact, when I was looking for my cover, and I type, this is the way I do some of my pictures, I'll type into Google. Um, I don't need to flag tonight for copyright. The when you do live stuff on YouTube, it gets flagged on. <laughs> the, 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 uh, the woman and the dragon, and all this book comes up. I guess it's a storybook for children. So you have to type in the woman and the dragon in the book of Revelation. And then you'll get some more images, if you will. But it's not, it's not a fairy tale story, but rather it's, it, it, it's this horrible reptile with legs. He's called the serpent in verse 9. In verse 4, he stood. Where does that take us? It takes us back to the book of Genesis in, in the garden. That, that reptile that seemed to stand and have this conversation with, with Eve. In verse 9, he identified as the serpent of old who was called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. This is who we're talking about. Now, first of all, I want to look at his description for the rest of our time tonight. First of all, he is a dragon. He is a dragon. Now, I didn't have time to put scripture on here, but we see several Old Testament scriptures where we see this word dragon, or lathiathon, that, that would mean the Old Testament dragon, if you will. And we don't have time to look at those scriptures, but in the apocalyptic literature of the ancient world, the dragon is likely the most common of all images that represents, simply represents evil. Well, that might not be the same image today that represents evil, but back then that image would represent evil. The dragon symbolized all that was wicked, destructive, and rebellious towards God. So first of all, right after, you know, if you say, what, if I'm in the first century, I can say, what is the worst possible image that I can present to you, to you that would say that this is totally against God? You would say a dragon. Second of all, well, notice the description. He is a red dragon. Now, the red representing the murderous blood that was shed because of this dragon. And his sinful nature. And so he's a dragon. Not only that, he's red. And, and there's a reason he is that color because of the blood that is shed because of his existence. Now also, notice some weird description. We try to picture this in our mind. He has seven heads. He's a seven-headed dragon. We can't picture that. 
Because we don't know anything with more than one head, do we? Well, maybe we've seen a couple, something with two heads, but rarely do we see anything with more than one head. So I have seven heads. Uh, seven heads probably represents his, his great craftiness and cunningness. We see in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3, But I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness. I often think, man, if I were in the garden, would I have made the same mistake that Adam and Eve had made? If it was not Adam and Eve, but Anne and Elvis in the garden. Or put your name in there. Would you have made the same mistake as Adam and Eve? Probably. Why? Why? Because the devil, our enemy, the arch enemy of God, is so crafty. I'm sure he doesn't sleep, but if he did, he would stay up late nights trying to think of ways to make a sin. And then the text says, your minds will be led astray from, look at this, and I highlighted this, the simplicity and purity of what? For the devotion to Christ. We complicate, and I understand Revelation is a complicated book, but Revelation taken out of that picture, we complicate God sometimes so much, and it doesn't need to be hard, it doesn't need to be complicated. You know, we put it in the simplest terms God loves us so much, and He wants us to, to respond back to that love and be obedient to Him. I mean, it sounds, what, simple and, and pure, doesn't it? That love that God has for us. He just loves us so much. And, and, and without the love that God has for us, we would not love each other. and we, we wouldn't understand what love is and know what love what was all about. So it's simple, it's, it's pure. But, but Satan wants to, to, to make it a mess and deceive us and, and, and throw a monkey wrench in there, as my dad used to say. Well, look at this. Not only is he of seven heads, but now do the math here. How many heads, how many horns do you put on the heads if you have seven and now you have ten horns? See, the math don't come out. When you're talking about Satan, it's not a perfect, complete number. God is two, 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 twelve. God has a couple complete numbers. Seven is one of them, twelve is another one. When you talk about Satan, you, you have to do some math here because you see it's not always straight. Horns are a symbol for what? Strength. You see an animal. The animal has horns. The animal uses those horns to fight off other animals, don't they? But the strength of Satan is nothing like the strength of Jesus. Not even close. And God knows that. Jesus knows that. The lamb's strength and the dragon's strength are different. The lamb's strength is inherent in his nature, and it's permanent. And the dragon's strength, Satan's strength, is only what God allows Satan to have and is temporary. How can ten horns fit into seven heads? Is any? It doesn't, it doesn't work. So we, have, we see symbolic language here. Well, on those seven horns, we see that these horns, I skipped one, it's not on the screen, I apologize. We see that he's crowned in seven, he's wearing seven diet, um, diet I can't say that word, seven crowns. So you saw the two different words for crowns tonight. You saw the crown of victory and, and, and the other crown. So we see him with seven crowns here. And, and on his head were seven diadems. That's the word diadem. And it's translated from the Greek word diadema, which means ruling crown. So, so the woman has the victory crown. Satan has the ruling crown. And that crown will be taken away from him soon. But then we have, it's a huge dragon. How do you get that? I don't see that in the text. Up there. Look at the text. What do you do with this tail? 
He swung that tail around and two third or was it one third of the stars of the so the sky started going down to the earth. Don't you think it was big? If the tail was that big to swing that tail, it's, it's huge in size, suggested by the comment that while crouching in the skies, a flicker of a flicker of his tail dislodges a third of the stars and sends them hurling to the earth. I don't think it's a little enemy that we're fighting against. I like what Paul says in Ephesians 6. This is almost a text to read before you get to Ephesians 6. Because sometimes we read Ephesians 6 and say, well, you know, I've been a Christian for years, nothing's going to enlarge me, I'm just going to... Ephesians 6, Paul would say, put on the whole armor of God. Well, why? And then he's going to go through all the different parts of the armor. Now, now some of the parts of the armor are what? One of the parts are our sword, which is the word of God. How do we fight this enemy? Right here. Remember, I said it was simplistic. I, I don't have to have grenades, although those might be fun for some of us, and throw grenades at Satan. That's not going to help. It's not going to work. I, I don't have to have big missiles or anything else. I, I need to have my sword... And then I can go through Ephesians 6 and see the whole armor of God that, that, that God wants me to have. And when I fight that battle, because this enemy is coming. Now we'll quickly close tonight. We'll look at the next verse. And she gave birth to a son. Ah, uh, finally. A male child. Oh. Who is to rule over all the nations with a rod of iron. And her child is caught up to God and to his throne. Am I describing Christ or am I describing Christ? That verse describes Christ almost to a T than a woman fled into the wilderness, the church, where she had a place prepared by God so that there she would be nourished for 1,260 days. And when we think of this, Eugene Peterson describes the scene as this. The moment the child appears, the dragon lunges. We, we, we shut our eyes to because we're too terrified to witness the outrage of the dragon, and we're fearful for the dragon. Then at the last possible moment, there's a rescue. The infinite is seized and lifted up to the throne of God. And it all rests upon the one clue. She was wearing a crown of victory. On her head. Before the battle had begun, the battle had been won. You see, the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared by God so that they would be nourished for 1,600, 1,260 days. Was Satan successful? Well, will we see what his original plan was? Probably not. The child had escaped. The dragon's grass. You see, when we come to the birth of Christ, we read through that in the gospel, so we notice that Satan is really trying to get Christ. First, Satan tries to get the child. If Satan can get the child, then there's no salvation for you and I. Second, if if, if Satan is able to make Christ sin. That's really kind of, oh, if I can only, it's kind of like, if I can bring Christ over to my side, if I can make Christ sin, just one sin, it doesn't have to be a big sin, just any sin, if I can make him do one thing, and so he puts Satan, if Matthew chapter 4, we read, we read that, he puts Jesus in all these awkward situations where Jesus hadn't eaten for 40 days, if you were hooked. We're that hungry. We're even eating for 40 days. And, and, and Satan's here to provide you with something to eat. And says, all you have to do. And he 
it puts them in a couple more awkward situations. You know, Satan looks at you and I as Christians and said, only I can make them sin. I love chocolate. Every now and then my wife buys me some sugar-free chocolate. She'll buy me a bag of these Russell Stover sugar-free Reese cups, and she'll just say, big old bag, eat one a day. How many of y'all think I follow that rule? That's a tough rule to follow, isn't it? I'll open that Reese cup up. Ooh. There's that bag staring at me. <laughs> See, sin's kind of like that, isn't it? If Satan talks us into doing one sin, the other sin is just sitting right there waiting. And it's not going to be that hard for us to, to look at more sin and say, well, I, I'm going to do that, I'm going to do that, I'm going to do that. And we forget that Satan is the arch enemy of God. He is. So God has a plan for us. It's a plan of love and a plan of sending his son, Jesus, to this earth to die for us. That we can have a, a home in heaven with him. If we're obedient, the plan is simple. If we believe that Jesus Christ is the son. If we repent of our sins us and God and changing our life. We confess that before man. We are baptized. Our sins are forgiven and washed away. We live a faithful life. We will spend eternity with Christ in heaven. Tonight, we need to respond to the invitation. Once you come, as we stand and as we sing. All things are ready. Come to the feast. Come
being the first day of the week, we still have the uh, opportunity to partake of the Lord's Supper. So uh, I know there's some of you here that's not done that yet today. So let us uh, have a prayer this time. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to in prayer this time. Uh, thank you, Father, for the sacrifice that was made for the whole world, Father. We thank you this time for the supplying us with this bread that we can partake at this time that would uh, represent uh, the body of Christ. And we just pray, Father, that you'd be with those who are partaking at this time and help them to keep their minds focused on, on the reason and the, that they're partaking of this bread. We pray this through your, uh, Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let us uh, continue in prayer and give thanks for the fruit of life. Dear Heavenly Father, we uh, again come to you in prayer uh, this time, Father. Uh, thank you for the supplying us with this uh, fruit of the vine, Father, which more importantly, Father, is what it represents, Father, in the, the Son, the blood, the blood of the Son that was sacrificed, Father. We just pray, Father, that uh, again you'd be with those who partake of this uh, fruit of the vine at this time. Uh, help us to uh, do it in a way to be pleasing unto you. And we pray this to your son Jesus' holy name. Amen. <coughs> this uh, concludes this portion of our worship this evening. Uh, is there anything else that needs announced this evening before we're dismissed? Okay, well, uh, remember, uh, we need to remember those who were mentioned that are having different health issues at this time and uh, the different people who are still dealing with loss of loved ones, and uh, we just need to remember all these people. And, and at all, every day we need to remember these people in our prayers. But uh, we'll go right now and uh, have a dismissal prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you at this time, uh, thanking you, Father, for this opportunity that we had to come and sing praises to you with with uh, others of like faith. And we pray, Father, that everything that's said and done here this evening was pleasing unto you. And we pray, Father, uh, for all those who are mentioned who are dealing with different uh, health issues and those who are struggling still with the loss of loved ones, that, that you could help them in a way, Father, that only you can, Father. You know everyone's needs, Father, so we just ask that you'd uh, help those who are in need. We also would like to pray, Father, for uh, our country at this time. We know that there's such division in, in, among our country, and it just almost seems like our country's in turmoil, Father. We just pray that, that you would uh, just please to show mercy upon our country. We pray that the people of this nation would look to you for guidance and uh, the violence that seems to be going through our cities, that this would come to an end, Father, that, that the nation would turn to you, Father, and that you could bless us like you've blessed us for, for these last 200 years, Father. We know that uh, we are so thankful that we have this country to live in, and we just pray, Father, that again, that you would uh, show mercy on this country, Father. And uh, we just pray also that you'd guide each and every one in this, uh, of, your con of your church, that that they would uh, always look to you for guidance and you'd guide us in our decisions. We pray, Father, you forgive us for we sin against you. And we pray this through Jesus' holy name. Amen. <laughs>